You know what's really weird? We hardly ever talk about levels anymore. Like, yes, we'll talk about set pieces, moments, plot twists, and all that type stuff, but in a gaming industry filled with open worlds, co-op raids, and story-driven chapters, the humble level is increasingly harder to define. Especially as after we've reached the credits or completed any chunk of anything, we'll talk about what worked and what didn't for the rest of time. Now at this stage I think we've discussed the likes of Battletoads Speed Up by Corridor or Max Payne's Blood Trails, so let's go with some newer examples. I'm specifically thinking of this current decade just to keep everything fairly recent. From crowbot infrustrations to sporadic tonal shifts built to appease the masses and everything in between, I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com and these are 11 terrible video game levels we can't believe got made. Number 11, Priority Palavin, Mass Effect 3. The more EA got involved with Mass Effect 3's development, you can just imagine how those pitch meetings started to go. Yeah, you've got your universe all sewn up, but where's the shooting? Where's all the stuff that we can put in the Super Bowl trailer? For whatever reason, Bioware caved and put everybody's least favorite action trope into the Palavin level. A freaking turret sequence. Yes, it was a basic road turret sequence in a Mass Effect game. It had about as much in common with the franchise as Rich does anything other than Tetris. You strap in, hold down the right trigger, and point the screen at a few waves of Geth for a few minutes. Woo who? Number 10, Dexter Industries, Hitman Absolution. Even if you've not played the fifth Hitman, you'll know its reputation from the fandom. I too question just what the hell IO were thinking, and Absolution feels like a studio aiming for that nebulous wider audience pull by adopting linear levels and losing stealth. Although this is Hitman and stealth is kinda what we're here for. Naturally, Absolution was received about as well as the Game of Thrones finale, the epitome of this new design ethos being Dexter Industries, a shooting gallery set up to let you storm a bad guy's lair with 47's twin silver ballers. You could try and play stealthily, but it felt broken, like forcing any random shooter to be a stealth game by hiding around corners or waiting for AI patterns to activate. We had a basic line to the target, simplistic room-to-room -room progression, and a reliance on using instinct mode to score headshots. Ironically, this kind of felt like a basic cover shooter wearing Agent 47 himself as a disguise. Number 9, The Condenser, Beyond Two Souls. I honestly really wanted to like Beyond Two Souls. The gaming industry always benefits from creative and ambitious minds like David Cage, but after Heavy Rain was arguably more charming than stilted, this should have been the game that everyone lined up to love. But no, Cage went back to his Fahrenheit roots. Leaping off an already supernatural premise about a girl and her ghost that was relatively grounded in its own contextual reality, we then had ghost fighting and quick time event platforming at every turn. The latter events were everywhere in the condenser as two souls wanted you to battle demons from another realm, but not before they started possessing corpses and swearing at you. By the end, you'd had a boss battle against a talking wall of sand and chosen your love interest from a menu. But this level was the turning point. The, oh, come on, David Cage, you've messed it up again, realization. Number eight, the tank battles, Batman Arkham Knight. Almost any time you see an out-of-place tonal change that favors action, it's in service of roping in the Call of Duty crowd. COD has become very easy to hate because of this, but the figures speak for themselves. Back to Batman and there's barely a soul on Earth who enjoyed Rocksteady's new tank battles. It's not that they weren't just repetitive to play through, but they didn't need to be in a Batman game like whatsoever. You shoot, dodge, build up a special missile barrage, rinse, repeat about 20 times. The worst part came when these were tied to pivotal boss battles like the Arkham Knight himself. And if that wasn't bad enough, after taking him down, Deathstroke pops up as another figure to chase after. Though when you do so, it's another tank battle. Literally the guy that Batman previously went gauntlet to blade against in Arkham Origins is reduced to shelling you from across a city block. Just awful. Number 7, Blight Town, Dark Souls. Stay your torches and plus one pitchforks, Dark Souls fans. I'm talking mostly about technical performance here, not the actual layout or Blight Town's more challenging nature. See, the level itself is actually a giant poisonous swamp, meaning that trudging through it sees you beset by constant damage, not to mention endlessly respawning flies floating towards you, melee focused enemies chasing you down, and occasional projectile throwers just in case you decided to exhale. Naturally, with all of this going on, the game couldn't really handle it, and the console versions to this day go from being playable to single digit frame rate nightmares. Dark Souls Flipbook Edition would be a more apt description, but as the Souls community take everything as more of a challenge, they just fat rolled with it. Number 6, All Tail Eavesdrop and Chase Missions, Any Assassin's Creed. It took Ubisoft until Assassin's Creed Origins to get rid of these things, but for almost a decade AC fans were enduring some of the most repetitive, annoying, and complained about mission design in gaming history. 
Pretty much anything involving tracking down a target in Ubisoft Assassin's Creed games was just a slog. Actually chasing the NPCs themselves always reverted to holding forward and the right trigger, whilst tailing was a case of not alerting them when in pursuit, and eavesdropping was the same but within a given radius. These were all mostly fine and actually pretty original back in the original games, but following that, diminishing returns set in and in a huge way. 2016 marked the first year Ubisoft took off since Assassin's Creed 2, and it was for good reason. They finally ditched these missions once and for all. Number 5. Chris Redfield's Levels, Resident Evil 6 Nothing says survival horror like cover shooting? Yes, even after Resident Evil 5 was panned by RE fans for essentially turning the series into Gears of Evil or something, Resident Evil 6 gave us zombies with machine guns. Now, admittedly, time has been relatively kind to RE6. Splitting the campaign into multiple character-led chapters is still a great idea on paper, especially as Capcom could give each one a number of different gameplay mechanics. They have to make sense in a Resident Evil game though, and Chris Redfield's parts of RE6 just played like some third-party shooter you'd ignore in a bargain bit. Here, you were continually thrown into quick time events and sections where the only objective was to cut through waves of zombies with turrets and machine guns. Nobody wanted this, nobody enjoyed this, and you can point to the change in genre as precisely why RE7 was then received so warmly. That not a hero DLC though? I see you trying to tick the action boxes again, Capcom. Less of that in RE8, thank you. Number 4, The Gutter, Dark Souls 2. Remember how I said Blight Town was a bit naff? Well, for the sequel, which saw creative director Hidetaka Miyazaki step out to work on Bloodborne, we got The Gutter, a pitch black noodle pile of ladders, wooden boards, and boxed in areas, purpose built to challenge, but it just ended up being annoying. I have to imagine it was first pitched as an area that would showcase Dark Souls 2's all new lightning engine, tying into the idea of lightning braziers and treating light itself like a tool across the entire game. However, when that mechanic was removed, the gutter became as boring and glum as it sounds. Underground areas in Dark Souls games are always harder than anything else, but this was just a slog. Number 3, Fighting the Werewolves, The Order 1886. There's nothing worse than when a game has everything going for it, only to trip and face plant the floor at the big reveal. Playing as a bunch of supernatural werewolf hunters in Victorian London, literally how does that go wrong? Turns out it was in fighting the werewolves themselves. You only do so three times in the entire game despite what the marketing materials would have had you believe, and all of these fights were either really crap feeling quick time events, or they relied on repeating basic patterns to win. Literally, you hit triggers and buttons to evade and attack in a canned animation, or you dodge and return fire after the werewolves charge at you like they're limping through the end of a marathon. Developers Ready at Dawn tried to make an argument at the time that overall game length doesn't always mean quality, but that only meant that we scrutinized what was included instead. All of this left the order to be something I guarantee half of you forgot even happened. Number 2, The Stutters, Quantum Break. Why won't Remedy just do another grounded action game like Max Payne? Alan Wake was solid enough, but Quantum Break is ultimately viewed as a failed experiment thanks to Microsoft abandoning their TV integration plans right around launch. Still, Quantum Break's core shooting is excellent, so why, Remedy, are you forcing us to endure platforming sections? Taking place inside various fractures in time as everything is frozen in place, you're tasked with getting through collapsing debris, obstacles that are glitching in and out of time, all while playing with terrible controls. Seriously, just imagine any dedicated third-person shooter's jump button or general movements being applied to a platforming gauntlet, and it was that bad. It's these sort of pithy physics that dictated how main man Jack Joyce would move, as barely any semblance of momentum governed anything, and the game even neglected to give you a shadow to show where he'd land. By the time you've died because a car decided to warp into your path or you touched a moving door, because yes, they are apparently that deadly, it makes you question just how the hell these sections in a cover-based story-driven shooter got approved in the first place. Please let control be good. Please. And number one, Traitor's Caravan slash Metallic Archaea. Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain. Fighting the Skull Unit in Metal Gear Solid 5 sucks. Like an overpowered loot shooter boss, the challenge is supposed to come from tackling an enemy far more powerful and agile than yourself, except for the skulls, they can just kill you in seconds. There's nowhere to hide when a handful of them appear at once, their weapons do ridiculously unfair amounts of damage, and if you attempt to flee, they'll just land right in front of you. Without a dedicated cover system and the mission dropping you on an open battlefield against tons of these guys who'll just fire on sight, it was ultimately bad game design. All this without mentioning that you couldn't even sneak up on these guys, which was kind of like the entire point of Metal Gear, as if you hadn't ranked up armored gear or more powerful weapons, the battles against these guys were just nigh on impossible. And that is my list. Let me know down in the comments if there were any other levels that stand out as just being terribly conceived in the first place. Ivan Scott from WhatCulture.com. Please subscribe to the WhatCulture Gaming Podcast channel, and I'll catch you soon.